I want to talk about Halo Wars 2, a game that I absolutely love as I knock stuff over like I always do. You know, just because I am the biggest smooth brain that there ever possibly is. A little bit of context on this service record. I've already gone over this, but as you can tell, I have never played. Well, I, I've played a little bit of the multiplayer, but uh, that was probably back in like 2019. I did not invest a lot of time into the multiplayer. I invested all my time into Firefight, a game mode that I think is absolutely amazing. It's difficult, which makes it stand out a lot more. Along with that, there's a lot of math involved, a lot of high skill, and a lot of repetitive motion with the two-hour matches that you guys have. Anyways, you guys are going to be seeing a little bit of a challenge run that we did the other day, which is half timers combined with double resource. We're going to be using Forge, Colony, and Anders. Now, Anders, I, I'm not going to say that she's amazing to use, in all honesty. She doesn't stand out as a super strong leader. She simply just hits a point and... That's about it. There is a couple of issues with her. She likes to give enemies veterancy, and that's about that. Captain Cutter, Isabel, those two, they're really good. However, Isabel is a lot better. Isabel is capable of overcapping her population past 200 with the Combat Salvage and the Spartan. You hijack a unit, activate combat salvage, jump out of the unit or get it killed, and it's going to spawn back at your base, which means that if you want to, you could have an additional 20 blister backs on the field if you're capable of hijacking a blister back every single time that it comes out. Sadly, though, you do not benefit from the damage modifiers that the wave gives you during that time, so there's that. Now, watching this gameplay, keep track on how fast we're moving, how difficult the enemies are, because this is on legendary difficulty. Legendary difficulty for a firefight is actually the easiest difficulty. Legendary difficulty makes a lot of things in the game easier for higher tier gameplay, just because hijacks is kind of the main source of damage, and a lot of the background play is primarily done by Kodiaks. You're capable of clustering Kodiaks at, let's say, Red's base at bottom right. Red, which is the host, should always play Banished inside Firefight. But then again, you always want to have a Banished on the team, just because Banished has got the best anti-air, until you hijack anti-air, and then that one hijacked anti-air unit is literally more damage output than an entire army of 10 Reavers with Skitters, which in all honesty, Colony is hands down an absolutely amazing character. Isabel having the chain gun, absolutely amazing, anti-everything, really good hero across the board, plus with the best defense, the best offense, yeah, the best offense, or best, it, it's one of her abilities, you, you get what I'm talking about. It lines up really well. Her ability, whenever you do the combat salvage, sadly, you do not get the wave modifiers from that ability, you lose them entirely, they don't exist, it's simply a unit you built, even if it's a locust sitting at your base. Decimus having some of the best damage output as Covenant, or banished and just absolutely phenomenal sadly though his boundless siphon was debuffed by 20 percent i want to say back in season 13. now talking about hijacks and going back to this subject sorry we've been doing this quite a bit from season 11 to season 15 scorpion tanks received a lot of love we're talking 45 percent cannon damage and a, an additional 10 percent damage to the machine guns if you're capable of getting scorpion tanks at let's say wave 30 those scorpion tanks are good all the way up to wave 100 that's how much damage output they have shrouds with shipmaster are some of the best in game along with that early game whenever you do your first upgrades take the passives get the marauder movement speed and then build three marauders so you're going to invest two points into that to be able to get the marauders out in the field but i'm telling you now those marauders with Shipmaster are capable of cloaking temporarily for quite a bit of time once you upgrade the Shrouds upgrades as well. And those Marauders on Legendary Difficulty are going to be helping you out all the way until Wave 30, being a really decent supply in the game entirely. Sergeant Forge, the individual that you're watching now, play me, play him. It's honestly a really good character, and I, I have nothing really bad to say about Sergeant Forge except for his leader by Wave 25 has already lost everything that he is capable of doing on legendary difficulty. On heroic difficulty, it's about 35. On normal difficulty, it's about wave 50, whenever he starts to lose all capabilities of being front row and relying on the anvil round. Colony. Colony offers a lot of versatility inside the match. Vehicle symbiotes. Skitters. In all honesty, Colony actually has one of the most active usable ability lineups in the game whenever it comes down to firefight you'll find yourself using everything that he he can offer pretty much like it's that good of an ability lineup except for his drops you'll never use his drops starting off you always want to take the wall ability 
The reason why is because whenever enemies are coming into the map, you're going to drop that right in front of the spire that you're defending against a double or triple funnel into that position. And suddenly, the Terminus is not taking any damage because they're super fixated on attacking the wall instead. Like, that's just how it goes. And then again, a lot of drops in game. Colony has got multiple units that drop in one drop. Um, his Hunter's Mark, however, I would not say is a great ability. That doesn't stand out that well. It's really fast. It doesn't do a whole lot of damage. A lot of the DOTs do a lot better. Uh, up next is going to be Sergeant Johnson. Now, a lot of people talk about Sergeant Johnson being a really good character in Firefight, and in fact he is. He provides a massive amount of view range. Once you get that network up, and I can't remember the, ab the abilities on it, but he provides mechs and combat salvage, overcharged mechs, you know, but whenever you play him, early game, if you're playing a legendary, maybe three mantises are not a bad idea to get out, but they're not exactly tanky. Then again, none of the mechs are tanky inside the game. They have a really decent amount of range, except for the Mantis. It doesn't have a whole lot of range. He kind of falls back just a tad bit. And his bunker drops, you can put down two garrison uh, bunker drops on, let's say, Orange's base. And Orange is playing as a banished. Now, those garrisons are pretty much cloaked, shielded, really hard to take down. Take eight snipers and put them inside those and suddenly anti-tank infantry in general, infantry, phantoms. I think phantoms are amazing. However, if you're going to be using phantoms, the best thing to put inside of them is grunts. That may stir up some controversy down in the chat, but that's completely fine of me. Grunts are middle ground against everything. They're not anti-anything. So you do two grunts and one hunter. Now, the reason why I do that and line up with two phantoms or maybe even three phantoms is because hunters have a beam they never miss grunts on the other hand they use a velocity type weapon the same thing as the condor the condor misses a lot of shots if you guys have ever watched your condor firings at the game grunts miss a lot of shots too however hunters don't so having grunts inside your phantoms allows you to assist with anti-air it allows you to assist with tanks having the hunters as well or if you want to you can do two phantoms full of hunters and just hit the ground as hard as you possibly can. Completely up to you on that one. And if you do it that way, then he's a little bit more viable for legendary difficulty. Plus, he's got a lot of movement speed whenever you're going to be using the conduit to rage and his plasma bolts to help him get around the map quickly. Plus, the stasis mines, make sure you don't drop them in the path because you don't want to slow down the enemies. It makes him fast. Arbiter himself, he, for me, he sits at the base and he's technically just an immediately immediate buff to get my units on the move that way they're relocating around the map as fast as possible because that's kind of the entire intention of it you just want that movement speed not to mention arbor i do believe has a better damage buff than decimus because you can make it last so much longer than decimus's damage buff by simply timing it correctly and dropping all your drops at the same time and completely panicking because you teleported your phantoms three and a half miles away from the fight but somehow your grunts are still firing into the abyss because they're broken temporarily until Conduit to Rage runs out and they're still dealing damage at three times the distance than they should be. Well, at least they're safe. You know, they're missing the scare, but at least the Hunter's still hitting the scare at that distance. Yes, you can technically glitch Arbiter to where he has infinite range on his units as long as Conduit of Rage is engaged. Jerome, being one of the top characters in the game, all of his damaging abilities inside of his ability tree, none of them are good. Salvo is decent at most. It does damage, but it doesn't do enough damage to kill outright. So, lots of fun. Lots and lots of fun. But Jerome, in fact, is number one. And then combine him with Shipmaster, number number two. Jerome, honestly, would have a higher placement than Shipmaster because he's a lot easier to use uh, because it, 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 you hijack everything. Personally, I hijacked two tanks and one Wolverine, and that's kind of my lineup there because that one Wolverine, as I mentioned before, does more damage than an entire army of anti-air by itself. But it's not going to be able to kill all of them at the same time because it's one unit, but it's that one unit that insta-kills anything it shoots at. Up next, Serena. I'm going to be honest. I absolutely hate Serena. She breaks the game audio every single time someone picks her. Like, just simply look at her. If, if you go in and you play Serena and you put the cryo on your Kodiaks, I'm going to freak the out, okay? You have no idea how irritating it is to just have all the game audio suddenly stop and you're sitting there thinking to yourself, I can't hear anything. It's, it's disorienting. 
Like it, it's just, sorry, I had to. Um, it drives me nuts though. Um, she's not bad though. In all honesty, if you don't get the cryo upgrades, she's actually a very decent character on the field. But Yap Yap's not a bad character. In all honesty, he's one of the best support characters in the game due to methane gas. Uh, early game though, he struggles. Cannon fodder, it's literally cannon fodder. Uh, throw rocks at air. At least you can throw rocks at air while melee characters just stare at them and at least you're doing damage. Um, Vortis, on the other hand, is literally just, he, you focus out blister backs of Vortis and it's amazing. That's pretty much all it is for Vortis. That's what you go for with him. That is the best selection in all honesty. The infusion gels, you don't need a whole lot of blister backs in the field um, in sets of two. So for instance, you can build eight blister backs and have them randomly placed around the map. And as long as you're spreading infusion gels all around the map, it's going to slow down enemies. It's going to do DOT. And then you have the cataclysm that you can pop. Plus his ability will, you have the mine, the infusion mine that you can drop literally the first thing that you can upgrade and early game on legendary difficulty. It is redonkulous that you're capable of popping that because it can literally wipe out entire waves coming from one flank if you have a single floor blade up and an infusion gel mine and it can wipe out an entire like not not heavy vehicles but it can wipe out an entire group of marines the vehicles are simply just going to drive by it but early game it's amazing you know and then being able to cloak out the terminus as well having a couple shrouds at the terminus all the time they never leave the terminus they're always there don't ever move them they stay at the terminus they don't move like three of them and like from Red's point of view at the spawn, whenever the map is situated the way that it is, where it's up and down, left and right, I mean, honestly, that's just in general from everyone spawning, readjust the way that you look at the map from Red's perspective. Now, the bottom right of the terminus is where you're going to place the shrouds because there's a really weird cone on the on the terminus that you need to hit for it to cloak out properly. And the bottom left is the best position to do it from. Now, at the start of the game, if there is veterancy on the map, I have a serious question for you. If you are the person that shoots it and picks it up and you put it on your marines and your grunts, did you get hit by a dumb ray that was overclocked with 5,000 megajoules of idiocy? If not, can you please stop? Because it drives all of us crazy. The moment I see somebody shooting a veterancy pod on the map within the first five waves and I've got my hero already building, I'm immediately like, I'm going to go on the start menu here. I'm going to scroll down to resign. And the moment I hear the audio cue of somebody picking up something, that's me. I'm already in another match. I am long gone by that point. There is no catching me. Anyways, guys, an actual guide to firefight is difficult to explain, but hopefully with what I told you about the leaders, the lineups, the abilities, combinations, believe me, hell charge from Kasano is absolutely dumb. I don't even think I mentioned that. It is what it is. And there are days that I am just the absolute biggest Muppet you would ever meet. And guess what today is? It's probably that day. Anyways, thank you for jumping in. Thanks for hearing this out. If you want to see a part two of this and actually see some gameplay and I'll collect some clips probably and go over the strategies that we use and everything else to achieve the world record run. Hopefully I still have half a brain by that point because I'm running on my last two brain cells right now.